Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, but not the topic I'm going to cover. That was last year's, actually. I'm going to be doing something different, although it does cover stuff related to U.S. I believe what you should really be knowing and how, how to think. Okay, because I don't want people. See, patients don't come in with multiple choice questions stamped on their forehead that say I have A, B, C, D, E. Okay, the stem of the question, of course, is going to be the chief complaint of the patient. And all the other stuff, the A, B, C, D, and E, is you asking the proper questions because you ask enough right questions, you're going to get the diagnosis. Okay, but you have to know what to ask. Okay, then of course, an excellent physical exam, and make sure you go to Dr. Mancioni's lecture. Uh, on uh, he's the expert on heart lung and uh, you know sounds, and of course that's on step one. You have to be able to recognize those things. He's the ace on that kind of stuff. So physical diagnosis plays a key. Laboratory medicine is the least important. If you don't know what, what to expect after a history and physical exam, then you haven't done a good enough one. Okay, so lab is like the least most important thing. So um, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different, uh, kind of a parting a little bit from what I normally do. We're going to use diabetes as a model for how you think. I'm going to prove to you, a lot of you hate basic science. You know, you get in there and uh, you take your first year to get biochemistry and anatomy, okay, and you're just memorizing all this crap with no clinical correlations at all, or if you're lucky, you're getting some, but you're not using the information. All you're doing is memorizing all this crap. You see, no, nothing important in the second year is the same thing happens, okay, and you're waiting for, you know, go do on rotations. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't get your basic science foundation really strong, there's no way in God's green earth you could be a good clinician. Because basic science is the actual base of learning and to be a good doctor. So I'm going to prove to you how basic science can actually, if you know it, and I'm going to use this as a model of diabetes, I'm going to show you how you think. I'm going to show you how Poppy thinks. Okay, now how did Poppy start learning how to think? Well, Poppy's was the first year medical student. I started thinking a little bit, but not too much, because it was biochemistry and anatomy with zero clinical correlations, okay? And he just walks home every all the time with that formic acid, formaldehyde smell, and everyone said, Ugh, that kind of stuff, okay? But then the second year came, and then I had a teacher. I went to Temple Med School. We had a teacher in pathology that as one of the lads would put a, a picture, a, let's say a gross of lung with some pathology in it, and they would pick out students and say, okay, what would this patient uh, present with as a chief complaint? We're just looking at that thing. And so, you know, eventually we're able to, just by looking at that thing, you see a little abscess there, a little cavitation. How do you think that would cough, you know? And that went from there. And it started, we see, I love this. That was the most uh, exciting thing that we had the whole second year. Was, was those lectures, and you know, we always went to those things. That started Poppy going and said, this is the way I want to be a doctor. Say, I actually read the basic science books. A lot of you look for the little ones, the ones that they had only five pages on it, you know, that's what you want. I actually read the textbooks, okay, because I had wanted to get that basic science background. I started to integrate. The term integration was not used when I was in medical school in 1964. That was not, we did, there was no integration between the basic and the clinical science of science whatsoever. None, zippo. Okay, but now, a lot of you have you know, problem solving courses and case studies, and that's very good. But still there's a problem, because you can't be any different than my students. And that is, they want to get basic science over with so they can get on to real medicine. Oh, you're making a big, big mistake. Okay, so this is Poppy, I don't know. That's my real name is Poppy. That's the alias. This is my actually uh, my hobby, and that's arm wrestling. Um, <laughs> pretty good at it. I compete with it. I'm, I'm kind of ranked in it. I kind of like it. But now I'm not supposed to not do it. Because my wife told me I can't do it anymore because I have one more stenosis, and I'm 71, and I shouldn't be doing things like that. They're stupid. Because I'm going to have to find a way of doing this, but whatever. <laughs> So I'm not allowed to do it here because if someone gets hurt, you know, then they have to bounce seven, you get sued. So we're not we're not doing any arm wrestling things now. Okay? You lose anyway, so it doesn't matter. 
There's nothing worse than being beat by a 71-year-old guy. Nothing worse. <laughs> nothing worse. I mean, you're never going to get over that, especially if they film it. They're stupid enough to film it. You can actually see that on some of the things that are out there on video of me with these guys and these huge guys and they lose and on the, you should see how they get ridiculed after that. That's a horrible thing. And it's suicidal. Okay, so I want to tell you how to So the integration was something I started with, right, with pathology, and then, you know, further on I, I started doing it on my own. But then when I went on, I did an internship at the Reading Hospital, and I did part of my pathology residency there. There was this head of the Department of Internal Medicine that was a doctor's doctor. Now, some of you have heard of that term before, some of you have not. In England, they call him Mr. When you reach a point where you're the best of the best. A doctor's doctor is someone that doctors send their patients to because they can't figure out what's wrong with the patient. That's a doctor's doctor. And it's my goal during this time, I'm getting goosebumps, that some of you are going to aspire to being that. But that means you're going to have to work hard. This is not one of these things, well, I'm only going to put a little bit of time here and a little bit of, no, 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 no. This is something that you have to decide you want to be. You want to be the best of the best. Why? So that they can pat you on the back and make a lot of money? God forbid if that's why you're in medicine. The reason why is because your patient is putting their life in your hands. Do you realize how important that is? They are life in your hands. How many things that people do out there as jobs have this, this involves putting people's lives in your hands? Well, they are. You make a mistake, it could be fatal. And so we're in a very interesting vocation here. You've got to know what you're doing. And you've got to love what you're doing, and you have to love your patients. Okay? So I'm going to kind of show you how you're supposed to think. And hopefully some of you will start doing what I'm going to teach you to do, how you integrate, and how I can prove to you how if you know the basic science principle, particularly things like what's the pathology of diabetes? Well, we have too much glucose. Well, so what? Well, if you have too much glucose, and you have glycosylization, I'll explain that what that means, and you have osmotic damage. Those two things, the main things that produce all the pathology and diabetes. Those are two basic science concepts. I'm going to show you how you can, by knowing that, figure out what kinds of signs and symptoms, what the clinical presentation of that patient is going to be. I'm going to show you. I can show you how to get diabetic ketoacidosis and show you why you get hyperglycemia. Why do you get ketoacidosis? It's all biochemistry. So if you don't know biochemistry, there's no way in God's green earth you're not going to you're going to understand ketoacidosis and all the other things that go along with that. Shock. You know why? Because you're losing lots of sodium and water in your urine because you have glucose in urine, which is osmotically active, sucking water and sodium out. And that's why they pee a lot. But they're peeing out water and sodium. That's why they're shocking when you see them in DKA. Okay, so I'm going to show you this. And so you'll see as a model, some of it's going to go over your head, whatever, that doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> if you have the rapid review book, it's all in there, okay. Because the rapid review book is the end product, actually, of, of notes that I gave medical students when I taught at medical school. These were my notes, you know, on all the different subjects in pathology. I taught all of pathology, okay. So these would be my notes. And they said, why don't I write a book? And so the rapid review book actually is my notes based on years and years and years of teaching and using integration. First laying a foundation of basic sciences, and then upon that, giving the clinical presentation, why you get that clinical presentation, and things like physical diagnosis, laboratory tests, and all of that kind of stuff is all there. It's all there, and that's basically the fruit of all that stuff. Okay. So now I'm retired, about four months since I've been teaching last, actually, and I'm enjoying it. But uh, I'm still going to probably be doing board of views, uh, but right now I'm on a, I'm on a sabbatical. Just to, just to rest, I've been doing it, I'm 71, and I've been doing this, oh God, 30, 40 years, i got to rest. I'm sick and tired of medical students. <laughs> quick question. Yeah, the quick question, how much could crush your head with quick questions? How many quick questions? Of course, they're very long. Okay. <clears throat> but anyway, so that's what I'm going to try to do. But anyway, I told you I was at the, the Reading Hospital, and there was this guy, the, uh, the head of the Department of Internal Medicine. Now, whenever someone couldn't figure it out, 
he was called in. He'd go in, four hours later, he'd come out with a diagnosis. No tests done, no further tests done, it was all there. So what I did is I studied this guy for a year, because I went on rounds, even though I was in a pathology residency, I went on rounds with the internists. Okay, and I went to their meetings when they, where they talked about the patients for two years. And I saw how this guy thought. Okay, so what was the thing that got, that, that, that was amazing? He didn't order any other test, but with the properly asked questions and, and, and tremendous physical diagnosis abilities, uh, he actually would come out with the diagnosis 100% of the time. Okay, so uh, the key thing is a strong base in the basic sciences, and then upon that, you're going to add the, uh, the clinical uh, sciences, and you, that's you can end up as a doctor's doctor. So what I want to do is just, this is kind of a little schematic, just showing the kind of key things, the basic sciences, there's the foundation, and of course the clinical. I mean, not, not the only book in the world is not rapid review pathology, we're linking these two, but it's a real good start. There's a good many of you that have used this in medical school, and you've done very well in your courses, and certainly on USMLE. By the way, it's fantastic for step two because there's so much clinical stuff in there and also even management, it's all there. So it's good for step one and step two and I can verify that by my own students who just kick butt on one and two, no problem, okay, with that. Because it's putting things together and that's the key thing. There's a lot of other great ones. There's a new one out, it's called Crush Step One. Uh, that's a great one. If you don't like an outline format or semi work, you just can't deal with that, then that would be the book for you because it's all prose. It's full sentences, okay? It's got a lot of fantastic pictures in it. I was very impressed with it. That's what the first time today, so. You know, if you don't like shortcuts, to, I mean, you know, outline format, a lot, of, a lot of students don't like that. They like real prose. That would be a great book, I'd say, okay, based on my initial uh, review of it. Okay, and they put all the, actually it counted up the, the, the numbers of these things. Now I had ADT, so it took about a week because I get up to about 215 and something with distract and I forgot where I was, and so I can vouch that all of these are exactly correct, but it took me a whole week because I had a recount because of ADD. Okay, which probably good many of you have in yourself. Whenever you have a, a student out there and you go like this in front of them, they're in ADD. <laughs> wow, wow, okay. And that's a sign of being smart, actually. ADD is actually seen in usually smart people, but you can miss a lot of information having it, so get it treated. Okay. Get it treated, okay. I'm big on tables. I think they're very important for summary thing. In fact, it's a mini microbiology book, this rapid review, because I have virtually any important microbiologic pathogen by system. I like system better to say what are the viruses, what are the bacteria, what, I like to put it in the context of, of what you're going to see in it. And so I, they, I've got good reviews on that. So the tables are really great. The schematics, the color pictures, pictures are the, one of the most important things for learning because you see a good picture, so a patient comes along, boom, you can make a diagnosis just like that. So pictures, positive, thank God, Elsevier I think is the numero uno uh, a company for, for books. So I got access to all their books. I got a pile this high of their books, and it's like it's like Christmas. And I have all these new editions of these books. The only thing is, I have to make sure I don't lie down. If they fall on me, they may crush me because I have some of them piled up on. Because fifth edition was going to come out in uh, two years, and so I'm already starting to start to collect and think, get uh, additional pictures, etc. So pictures are very, very, very important. And margin notes, I'm not the only one that's sort of this, but uh, margin notes, but I think I use it the most. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple examples that we're talking about, and then we'll do this uh, diabetes model. I like collages, I call this a collage. It kind of puts like the hyperlipidemias, for example, uh, together. And not only that, it uses this for unknowns for you because they, what they are is down here, but uh, they don't have what it is up there, so you can't cheat. Okay, so that it not only should gives you pictures that are top quality pictures of things, okay, but it also gives you an opportunity of, of testing yourself, you know, when you're learning these things. For example, uh, this up here, this A over here, that's an Achilles tendon exanthoma. If you saw that on the patient, you just diagnosed familial hypercholesterolemia, an autosomal dominant disease, where at birth, the cord blood LDL levels, and of course, Paris cholesterol is increased. 
these kids die uh, 18 years of age of heart attacks and strokes. You just make that a simple thing. Well, I thought that was a callus. Well, there you go. That's wrong. It's not a callus. Calluses aren't yellow. Yeah. Of course, you see this a lot of people. It's a little patch there on the eye. This is called exant, which means yellow. Elasma, which means eyelid. Okay, this means this patient needs an LDL. They have high low-density lipoprotein. They have hypercholesterolemia. You can save their lives by just simply knowing, I got to get this lipid profile. I got to get these lipid levels down so they don't have atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, strokes, etc. A simple thing like that. So that yellow is cholesterol. Now this I've never seen yet. These are palmar xanthomas. If you look at the creases and there, you can see yellow, kind of a blotchiness. That's a rare hyperlipoproteinemia called dysphagia lipoproteinemia, which is type 3. So again, physical diagnosis, looking at something, quickly making a diagnosis. Picture's very important. Now, this is a nice smile on this patient. No, that is not a smile. Okay, that is a butt. That is a crease, a butt crease. So if you thought it was a smile, no, they would have to be laying like that in the picture taken, and it isn't. Okay, so some of you need a lesson in anatomy in terms of whether that's a a smile versus a butt. Okay, you see these little papules all over there, and not only that, all over the body, you diagnose type 4, type 5 hyperlipoproteinemia there. VLDL, which carries triglycerides, it's too high. So piles of these kinds of collages are in the bar in the book. And you can see there's lots and lots of pictures. Fun stuff. This is just an example of the margin notes. And basically what I do when I, when I made up this kind of concept is when I, when I wrote something, I said, okay, I want to pick out the key things of what I just wrote, and I make a margin note. So these margin notes actually summarize the key things that are present in these. So those are another key thing that students have found very useful. All right, now let's get into the, the real thing here. I'm going to show you first basic science, and then we're going to think about clinical things that can arise because of what we're seeing here. Now basically, uh, I know there has to be some diabetics in here, some probably mainly type 1 with your ages, okay, possibly a few type 2s in here, okay. Did you know that if your glucose is normal, you're normal. All the pathology of diabetes is completely related to high glucose levels, nothing else. So if you keep the glucose normal, they're normal. It all relates to glucose. Now I'm going to show you two things, two major things that are responsible, okay. Glycosylization. Glycosylation. Okay, what does that mean? That means glucose is attaching to amino acids. Okay, glucose is attaching to an amino acid. And it's not an enzyme-mediated reaction, so it's a non-enzymatic glycosylization. Now, a lot of you know about hemoglobin A1C. You know, that's glycosylated hemoglobin. Okay, that's, that's glucose attached to hemoglobin A. You all know that that's a sign of what your uh, last 8 to 12 week glucose levels are. Fantastic. They can even diagnose diabetes now with that. So it's that. So why is that important? We're going to talk about why is that important here? Well, we're going to talk about arterioles. So there's some anatomy there in arterial, okay? And in diabetes, with a high glucose level, there's glycosylization. The glucose will attach to amino acids that are in the basement membrane. That's called glycosylization. So you say, so what? Well, it renders that basement membrane permeable to protein. What do you mean? It starts leaking? Yeah. What's going to leak? Well, the proteins that are in the plasma are going to leak through the basement membrane into the wall of that arterial. Well, so what? Okay, this is, this is so what? Look at these arrows. See all that pink crap in there? Hmm? See that? That's plasma. That's in the wall of that vessel. Look at the lumen, guys. Look how narrow the lumen is. Very, very narrow. Think now, if you had arterioles in, you know, anywhere in the body, and hyaline arterial sclerosis, would you all agree that the blood flow to that tissue would be decreased? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, if that's true, is there a possibility of, infarction? we get actually necrosis of that? Sure. Okay, well, let's say it's a slower process. Would you all agree that there would be some, maybe some organ dysfunction because it's lacking oxygen, because you know oxygen is being carried in the blood? Would you agree? What do we call atrophy? What's atrophy? That's where the, uh, the, the tissue is either lost or the individual cells in that tissue get, get smaller. So we know for a fact that any organ 
that had serious hyaline arterial sclerosis would have definite signs of possibility of infarction with necrosis of that tissue, or at least atrophy of that tissue, or at least organ dysfunction in that tissue. Would you all agree with that? So your basic science concept is like a salation. Okay? And then we've seen clinically what the results of that can be. So I'm going to show you two things that we see in diabetes. This is called nodular glomerular sclerosis. This is the most common kidney disease that one sees in diabetics that are lousy control. Okay? Okay, so uh, if we look at this over here, this diagram over here on the left. Now, there wasn't an efferent arterial. In fact, you can't tell histologically which one's the afferent arterial, which one's the efferent. Okay? But I just made it for, for purposes of teaching you. I actually, actually had to draw one. Okay, so uh, that's the efferent arterial. Now, for some crazy reason, the efferent arterial in a poorly managed patient with diabetes undergoes hyaline arterial sclerosis before the afferent arterial. I have a feeling it's because it takes the most pressure, because it's draining the capillaries. That's probably the reason. But whatever, uh, let's say it looks like that, a narrow room. And I want you to think now. So they say, so what? So what if that happens? OK, remember, afferent goes to the capillaries. Capillaries is drained at the efferent. Efferent goes out into your vessels down there in your renal medulla. Agreed? So what's going to happen to the pressure if you have uh, something obstructing blood flow in that efferent arterial? It's going to increase, isn't it? It's going to back up into the glomerular capillary. Agreed or not agreed? Are we all agreed on that? So would the glomerular filtration rate or the creatinine clearance actually increase? Sure. 200, 250. Now wait a minute. Didn't we say that uh, uh, hyaline, like the glycosylization, uh, uh, the glomerular capillaries could have occurred there? Sure. And what did we say happened when amino acids are attached to the basement membranes, let's say glomerular capillaries? It rendered them what? Permeable to protein. So can you picture under this increased pressure, glomerular capillaries that are undergoing some glycosylization, glycosylization as well, that you've been beginning to leak some protein into the urine. Yes or no? This is called microalbuminuria. Now some of you think, so what? But those of you that know where I'm going with this, say, this is big time. Because it means that the patient has renal disease, one. And two, it means that they have to take an ACE inhibitor. But we'll, we'll not get into that because it's getting a little beyond what I'm trying to teach you here. But it gives us an opportunity that, to know that this patient has kidney disease and that this patient's glucose level is in control and this happens and completely shuts, a, is, is not taken care of and then eventually the afferent arterial gets hyalinized and that kidney's going to die. No afferent arterial blood flow, no efferent blood flow. What's going to happen? The kidney has to undergo atrophy and that's what happens. And that's why diabetes is the number one cause uh, for renal uh, dialysis in the United States. It's because of poor control ending up with poor uh, nodular glomerular sclerosis, all related to glycosylization, that concept. You understand? Okay, now, there are dipsticks that can pick up those trace amounts of albumin. Okay, and that's every doctor should always be doing that on their patients with diabetes. But what if this isn't taken care of? They don't go and see a doctor. Eventually they spill more and more out here to the point they're losing greater than 3.5 grams in 24 hours. What do we call that, guys? Nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome. Here's another basic science concept here, guys. Okay, what's that basic? It's called Stalin's pressure. Now, one of the things you learned in physiology that you just went in one ear and out the other. All right, we got to build that to the, the, uh, the, uh, the onchotic pressure and the hydrostatic pressure. Onchotic pressure is albumin, and it likes to keep fluid in into, into your small vessels, right? So you don't leak through your capillaries, agree? And, and who's the arch enemy? The hydrostatic pressure is trying to push it out. So who's winning most of the time? Oncotic pressure is greater than hydrostatic pressure, so we don't leak any fluid out into our interstitial space from the capillaries and the venules that are leaking. Right? Okay, so what's going to happen then when the oncotic pressure out of humans decrease? Now who's winning? By the way, all medicines who's winning? Oncotic pressure is winning in you and me right now, I hope. Okay? 
But in someone with diabetes or anybody with nephrotic syndrome, who's winning? Hydrostatic pressure, and it's pushing fluid out. Now, who can tell me what's it pushing out? A lot of protein? No, because the basement membrane uh, is, 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 uh, is not glycosylated. Okay? But what would be pushed out? Water and sodium is going to get pushed out. Okay, where? Into the interstitial space. Remember, that's part of your extracellular fluid compartment. Agreed? Okay, now the interstitial space has no boundaries, does it? So that means all this fluid, and it could be liters, six, seven liters of fluid in that interstitial space. It obeys the laws of gravity. So I'm standing right now. Let's say I had nephrotic syndrome. Where would that fluid go down to? My ankles. That's the bang of the law of gravity, isn't it? Just like it did in this patient here. Notice, what is this? That's called pinning edema. This patient has this carrying around liters of excess sodium and water in that space, and they say, I can barely move my legs, and, and, and my, my shoes get, I can't fit in my shoes at the end of the day. And then you just press gently in there, and you got your pinning edema, you say, oh my God, this patient has uh, an alteration in stomach's pressure. And certainly that's gonna happen in someone that has, uh, that has uh, uh, a problem with uh, the albumin and the frontic syndrome. Okay? What's another thing that can happen? You get effusions. For example, you can leak from serosal membranes. Okay? The hydrostatic pressure pushes out, so you get pleural effusions, or maybe into the abdominal cavity, you get ascites. See, they're all basic science concepts that you can figure out. Okay? So I think that's a, a good example, uh, one example of uh, Highland arterial sclerosis and how we're we able to take basic science concepts and be able to apply them to things that actually make sense. And medicine does make sense, but you have to understand it first, not memorize it. Okay, lacunar infarcts, extremely common, and it's all due to Highland arterial sclerosis. And so what's going to happen is you get these little areas, microcystic infarctions throughout the brain. Notice that brain that's lost there. Look at that. Look at those little spaces there. Why? Because of ischemia, because of hyaline arterial sclerosis. In fact, a uh, good USMLE question would be, the patient has a pure motor stroke, in other words, just atrophy or something of that nature, or weakness, or a pure sensory stroke, would just have, you know, paresthesias and numbness and that kind of stuff, they have <coughs> lacunar infarcts. Why? Because little pinpoint areas of, of, of problems, you don't get all of these at once, maybe get one first, and that can just affect, you know, one area, and maybe just in an internal capsule with a motor, if it fires up, boom, you get a motor type of stroke. Or it could be in another area, you could have a sensory. So when you see most strokes, you have both motor and sensory. But in these types of strokes, it can be actually isolated motor strokes or sensory strokes, you just know that. And you know the pathogenesis of that is Island arterial sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, osmotic damage. First of all, what's your basic science concept? What's osmosis? Fluid moves from low to high. Fluid moves from low to high. Okay? To try to reestablish the osmolality on both sides of the, of the semi permeable membrane. Diffusion is high to low. You're having diffusion at your tissue level now. Your oxygen levels in your capillaries are higher than in your tissue, and so by the law of diffusion, you're pushing oxygen into tissue. So that's high to low. Osmosis is low to high. And what's moving? Water is. It's going from a low concentration to a higher concentration. That's the, that's the process of osmosis. Now let's see how that works in, uh, in diabetes. Is glucose an osmotically active substance? Yes. I mean, when it's in the urine, didn't it suck out a lot of water from your renal tubules, and that's why you have polyuria? Isn't that a very common thing? Sure, because you have glucose in there. So it's osmotically active, sucking water out, and sodium out, you know, into your urine, okay? But another thing that's actually osmotically active, even more so than glucose, is sorbitol. Sorbitol is actually a gum. You know, is that sorbitol in there? It's a gum, sorbitol gives a sweetener. Okay, now, Here's a little enzyme called aldose reductase. For those of you looking for names for kids, aldose would be a great one for a boy. I think so. I mean, how many people know that it's an enzyme? Nobody. So, you know, aldose, what a unique thing. Very good. My favorite is malacetia furfur. That's a fantastic name. 
my daughter almost had, she's, she got out, she's married to a Colombian, and so they had a little girl, and I almost convinced my daughter to name her Malasasia. Okay. And then I said, your middle name could be Furfur. Okay. It's, uh, it's some kind of bug, isn't it? And it's just a fungus. <laughs> lots of great names in microbiology that'd be great names for kids. But it's a really good one. Aldous. Okay, now notice what it does. It converts glucose to sorbitol. Now that is really osmotic. They make way more than glucose. Now here's an interesting thing. Basic science. Where's it located? One place it's located is in pericytes around the retinal vessels. One area you don't want to have a bleed is in your stinking retina. Okay, so there's extra cells on the outside of the retinal cells that are called pericytes to give more structural integrity to the vessels there. Well, unfortunately, it has aldose reductase on it, which means that if the glucose is out of control, then that means sorbitol is made, then that means you're sucking in water into those pericytes and destroying them. Well, think about it. If you're weakening a vessel, what happens when you weaken a vessel in a little area? You get an outpouching, right? What do we call little outpouching a vessel? What's the term for it? Say aneurysm. Aneurysm. I'm helping you so you don't feel stupid. <laughs> it's better to just help you. Okay? Get the misery over with. I knew it once. I knew it once. It's aneurysm. Okay? That's a concept, isn't it? Just for fun to see if you read your thinking. What's the quote aneurysm of the lungs? Remember, it's a weakening and an outpatching. Come on, what's a, what's, a, what's a quote aneurysm in the lungs? Bronchiectasis. Right? You're weakening it with infection, you have an outpatch. Yes or no? It's a basic concept. This is an easy one. What's an aneurysm in the GI tract? Weakening and outpatching. Diverticular disease. What's the most common cause of sigmoid diverticulosis? Constipation. Poppy is never constipated. <laughs> so there's a concept there, weakening outpatching. Weakening. This is this is very helping you become a doctor's doctor. When you're starting to put these things together, and they actually make stinking sense. But anyway, if you're getting microaneurysms of those vessels, you can't really see that here because it's too small. You're going to get hemorrhages and retinal detachment. That's why every year diabetics, whether you're one or two, have to go to a retinal person that identifies these microaneurysms and they laser them before they do that. The most common cause of blindness in the United States is diabetic uh, 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 disease in the, in the, in the uh, retinal vessels. Mechanism? Sorbitol. Okay, with destruction of pericytes. Guess it'd be fun when you understand what the heck it is, huh? As opposed to memorizing it? That's a waste of time. Okay, uh, here's another thing it said, Schwann cells. That's just knowledge you don't know what a Schwann You better know what a Schwann cell is. It makes myelin. It's, it makes myelin, like oligodendrocytes make myelin in the brain. Schwann cells make it in the peripheral nerves. And so sorbitol's in there, it's gonna suck water and destroy it. So that means you're going to destroy myelin. How do you think that would present clinically? Numbness and paresthesias, burning pain. Poppy has that now because I have compression in my peripheral nerves and lumbar stenosis. It's not diabetes, but I know it exactly. I have numbness right now and I have paresthesias, burning feet. Doctor feels like ants are biting me. That's what they're going to have. That's sensory. But then when that myelin goes and the axon is not protected and you knock that off, then what are you going to get? Muscle atrophy, the muscles are going to go. That's what's called sensorial motor peripheral neuropathy. Most common cause in the United States. Diabetes. Mechanism, osmotic damage. So what kinds of things are we going to see? Guys, when you have diabetics, always look on, on their, underneath their foot because they can't feel anything with peripheral neuropathy. I can't feel the bottom of my feet right now. So unless someone looked, they would never see this neuropathic ulcer. Never see it. Eventually, you'll get infected, probably end up getting gangrene. The reason why they have this neuropathic ulcer is because they can't feel there, because they have a peripheral neuropathy. Then you knock off these big nerves, like perineal nerves, you get foot drop, okay, you walk with a slapping gait, and I'm kind of getting close to that. I don't have it quite yet. If I do, it's probably an indication of getting surgery, but I'm trying to hold off on that. But anyway, so you can get foot drops in different types of peripheral neuropathy. So again, a clinical application of something 
that we, as, as a basic sign constant. Did you know the lens of the eye has aldose reductase? Not good, because it's going to suck water into the lens. Anyone in this room knows that any person that is constantly having to have refraction of their eye, they go, everything's fine for a week or two, and then, then, then it's blurry again. If you're not thinking diabetes, what aren't you doing? Say it. If you're not thinking. <laughs> Because what's happening is you're pulling water into that lens, it's altering the refractive index. That's why that's a big thing, right? And eventually you think maybe you're going to get cataracts from that? Okay, what do you think one of the most common causes of cataracts is? Diabetes. So here's three major diseases here involving the vessels in your brain, where you get readily detached with blindness, involving your feet, neuropathies and, and, uh, and ulcers, and then also involving your lens, all related to a basic science concept of osmosis, in this case, related to sorbitol. Make sense? OK. All right, now the tough stuff. How do you get ketoacidosis? If you don't have biochemistry, you probably should just close your eyes and just, uh, you know, just go down. <laughs> this is big time biochemistry. <laughs> Because probably for those of you, depending on where you are, there might be some pre-med students. Forget it. You might as well just leave. <laughs> You're not going to get this. Okay. Because you could probably be a second year medical student. First year medical, just had biochemistry, wouldn't get it either. Okay. Why? Because you got to know basics first. You have to know what insulin does. What state, fed state or fasting state is insulin only in? Fed state. Okay? So it's, why? why? Because insulin likes to store things like, like, a, like a squirrel stores acorns. Okay? What does it like to store? It likes to store glucose as glycogen. And it does it in muscle, but that just hoards it for itself. You all know that muscle doesn't get, when it breaks down the glycogen in the muscle. You think it shares or whatever? No. <laughs> What's the first word that kids say, the you know, little ones say? Mine. Right? And it's not mama, it's not pop, it's mine, isn't it? You take the little squirrel from them, the little rodent thing, the little, little rabbit from them, what do they think? Mine, 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 mine. That's the first word they say. Right? OK. So uh, they store it in the uh, muscle. And then it's the one in the liver. Now the liver shares. Do you need glucose over here? <laughs> <laughs> he just loves it. Liver loves you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now how does insulin do that? Well, if I were insulin, I would like to make sure that the rate limiting enzyme was induced and it was there. Well, that's what it does. It actually synthesizes glycogen synthase so that you're able to do that. What's the other thing it likes to store? Triglyceride and fat. Now, a lot of us like to store it in fat too, but that has nothing to do with this one. It's <laughs> eating too many chips or something like that or whatever. But anyway, it likes to store triglyceride in the adipose. It's storage in there. Okay. So there's a few things we'll see that it has to do to make sure that that happens. Okay, so that's what insulin does. Then in the fasting state, the counter-regulatory hormones are coming to play. And the big ones are glucagon, another one is epinephrine, and another one is even cortisol. It's not listed up here, but cortisol fits into that too. So basically, this is a great a ketoacidosis and understanding is, is actually a very, very heavily tested thing on the USMLA because all medical students should really understand it. It's a beautiful example of biochemistry at its absolute best. Okay, so we're going to deal first with the hyperglycemia part of it. Okay, the basic science of it. We'll see what insulin does. We know that it likes to store glucose as glycogen. It likes to store it in muscle, it likes to store it in the liver. Okay. So let's deal with that. Okay, so insulin and DK is, is not present. Remember that's uh, diabetic ketoacidosis may be seen in type one. Type twos have insulin but not enough to prevent uh, uh, enough to prevent ketosis, but not enough to prevent hyperglycemia. So they get something different. So this is Type 1 diabetes we're talking about here. Okay, so let's deal with it. Okay, let's deal right here with the body. Okay, now we're in the diabetic ketoacidosis. There is no insulin. But epinephrine's there, and glucagon's there, and cortisol there. They are there big time. 
Okay, so that's the scenario now. So let's look at this bottom one here. Remember, glucose actually increases the uptake of glucose in two major things, right? One is, of course, in the muscle, and the other one is in the adipose. Now, when it does that, the real basic science of it, uh, you know, is that they, when it hooks into receptors there, right? And these receptors have tyrosine kinase on them. Whenever I say kinase, you should be saying phosphorylation. Kinase. Very good. <laughs> you were actually listening. That was very good. Okay, so what does that do? It sends a phosphorylated message to release the glucose transport units so that they're in the ins inside parts of these cells and they need to get from there to the membrane so they can bring glucose into the cell. So they have to move from the inside to the outside on the surface. They're called glucose transport units. Specifically, if glucose transport form that normally if insulin's there, uh, it would be there and bringing in glucose to these tissues. Okay? But insulin isn't there now. Okay, so that means then that GLUT4 is not on the cell membrane, therefore the glucose that should be going to muscle and adipose is. So that's going to increase glucose, of course, in uh, diabetic ketoacid, but that's clearly not the most common thing. So what's another thing? Well, what's the opposite of making glycogen? Well, breaking it down, that's called glycogenolysis. Of course, epinephrine is fairly big on that, particularly uh, in muscle, breaks down the glycogen in muscle, glucagon, types to break it down uh, in the liver. Okay, so you're going to be breaking down the glycogen there, and that's going to definitely contribute to the hyperglycemia. However, eventually all that glycogen is gone, so that can't possibly explain why they have you know, such high glucose levels. It contributes, but it's certainly not the major thing. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm just trying to do this as simple as I can. Of course, I had to read this thing about six million times this week, okay? Being away from teaching for three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, what is the most important thing? Gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. Now, students don't get it. How could you make glucose from an amino acid? They don't get it. Is it possible? No, it's not possible. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. You got a whole and you make it into carbohydrate. <laughs> it's, it's all over for you, you know? I don't get it. If I don't get it, I'm not going to just memorize it. It's the main way we get glucose in the fasting state. But this isn't the fasting state. This is someone with no insulin. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, glucagon. Where do you think the name glucagon came from? Gluconeogenesis. It's the king of gluconeogenesis. Okay, there are other things. Cortisol can also produce gluconeogenesis. So, I told you that you have to have amino acids to make glucose. So, we have to break down muscle. So, you have to break it down. So, there's a lot of protein degradation. So, you got lots of amino acids. Now, the two main amino acids that are important in gluconeogenesis are alanine, okay, and aspartate. Now, a lot of you don't know, know this. You know the transaminases. You know ALT, okay? Or most of you know ALT and AST. Maybe you used to know them as SGOT, SGPT. No one uses that anymore. It's amino, uh, alanine amino transferase is the correct term for ALT, and aspartate amino transferase is the correct term for AST. Now, these are transaminases. Now, watch this, guys. When ALT is present, and it's always present, it takes the amine group that's an ammonia group out of alanine and causes it to become its corresponding alpha keto acid. So what we got to do is take an amine group out of alanine and look what it became. Uh, where is it? Pyruvate. Is that not the first substrate for gluconeogenesis? So where did it come from? Alanine. Where did that come from? Muscle. At what expense? Breaking it down. That's why type 1 diabetics are thin, not obese. Because they constantly have this breakdown if they're not in good control because lots of gluconeogenesis is going on. Do you understand? You <laughs> see where we're going here? Okay, <laughs> kinda! Okay, all right. Now what does AST do? It takes the amine group out of aspartate and it becomes oxaloacetic acid. Are these not two major substrates in the initial uh, uh, formation of, of glucose by gluconeogenesis? Yes or no? Yes. So of these three different things, breaking down glycogen, not glucose not being taken up by the adipose, and gluconeogenesis, which of the three is most responsible for the hyperglycemia and DKA, please? Gluconeogenesis. There you go. That's on boards, guys. 
So I am keeping a little bit of this thing in there. Oh, you bet that's all. You bet. You know how they proved it? They gave glucagon to a patient with DK by glucagon inhibitor, and the glucose went up to normal. So it proved that glucagon was a key factor. Okay, so a lot of you didn't know that. Now, we already did mention this. If you have very high glucose levels, so you have very, very adrenal thresholds for glucose, and it's certainly going to be surpassed for all the glucose and then should get peed out. And because it's osmotically active, you're going to lose a lot of water and sodium. Water and sodium. Both things are going to be out. You lose sodium, guys, you can go into shock. For any reason. You lose sodium, you go into shock. You see a patient DKA, you usually have lost six to eight liters of fluid, and they're in shock. Hypovolemic shock from osmotic diuresis. Your first step isn't giving insulin, your first step is giving normal saline to get your blood pressure back to normal. Once you get it back to reason to normal, then you start fiddling with the insulin. The first thing is they can die of shock before you actually begin treating them. Basic science concept, osmotic diuresis, glucosuria. Yes or no? I think I'm going to lose their learning is. So good. And maybe it'll last a week, but you know, if you keep on going, right? Your doctor's doctor. Get out there and solve things that other people don't. Because you have to put the time in. This is not, there isn't any single book. They, you know, they, they, it's, it's just lots of different things that are involved in this thing to become a doctor's doctor. And all of you really should aspire for that. Okay, where are we here? Almost uh, done here, all right? Now, the tough part is this one. One thing I thought this was hard. Okay, well, this is hard. Okay, how do we get the keto acidosis? Well, first of all, we need to know what insulin does. Because if we know what it does, then we know that if it isn't there, what's going to happen? So, we said that insulin likes to screw a triglyceride in the adipose, yes or no? Well, how does it do that? One, it increases fatty acid synthesis. You know why? Because it induces acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the rate limiting reaction. It doesn't. It wants fatty acids. Why? Who knows what triglyceride is? Okay? Glycerol, say glycerol 3-phosphate. Just say it. Glycerol 3-phosphate. No, no, it's not say triglyceride. Okay, so you got this glycerol. So, you know, so that glyc is glycerol 3-phosphate? Yeah. The tri is for the three fatty acids attached to it? Yeah, that's why it's glycerol free. Not one, not two, three. That's triglyceride. It's glycerol 3 phosphate, which of course is, a, is the three carbon compound in normal uh, glycolysis. Yeah, and you put three fatty acids on it, that's triglyceride. Okay, so it actually enhances fatty acids. That's not good. It enhances fatty acid synthesis. Okay, now it's saying to itself, it doesn't have a brain, it can't talk, Poppy. Yes, it can. If you really, really listen, you can hear insulin talk. <laughs> 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 it's rolling. So it does have a voice. Okay, it says to itself, Self, so, I ain't going to make this fatty acid and have it being oxidized. That stinking carnitine acyl transferase wants to break it down immediately to acetyl coli. Not going to happen! So how it does, does it do that? It hires one of its intermediates to make a fatty acid for malonyl coa. Even sounds like a bad guy. Mal means bad, evil. Malonyl yes. coa, yes. We want you to stick a gun to the head of quarantine acyl transferase. You know what that is? Yes, it's in the liver. Yes, and make sure it doesn't break it down, beta oxidize it. Got it. Okay. Now, once triglyceride is in the adipose, we've got to keep it there. There is an enzyme that has to be inhibited, therefore. What's the name of that enzyme that it has to inhibit? Hormone-sensitive lipase. Because if that was activated, then it would break down the triglyceride and the fatty acid, just what it wouldn't want to do. So to keep triglyceride there, the person has to make fatty acids so that you have substrate to make triglyceride, and two, it has to inhibit hormone-sensitive lipase to keep it there. Agree? Okay, it ain't there now. You're in DKA. And you got glucagon, and you got epinephrine there. Well, what is it going to do? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to, you know, first of all, there's, there's not going to be any uh, 
uh, fatty acids there because it's going to be beta oxidized. Why, why are you going to have, why are you going to have breakdown of the triglyceride? What did I say? What was the enzyme that kept it there? Hormone sensitive lipase. What if I told you epinephrine activates hormone sensitive lipase? What's it going to do to that triglyceride? Break it down. Into what? Fatty acids. Okay. So you have the fatty acids now. Is malonium CoA present if insulin is, is absent? No. So what's to prevent carnitine acyl transferase of beta oxidizing? Nothing. So I'm going to ask this question. What is the end product of beta oxidation of fatty acids? Acetyl-CoA. What does the liver do with excess acetyl-CoA? Talk to me. It makes keto acids. Name the keto acids. Acetoacetic acid, beta hydroxybutyric acid. There you go. Lastly, Okay, and that's how I'm going to finish right with this one. Okay, and that is capillary lipoprotein lipase. Insulin uh, actually synthesizes capillary lipoprotein lipase. Okay, and what that does is it does that, needs that because high remark ones, which is the fact that we eat, we eat bacon and crap like that, that's going to be packaged as high remark one. VLDL is a triglyceride that we make. Okay, and so if you activate capillary lipoprotein lipase, and you can get some fatty acids and glycerol that would be useful in making triglyceride. Okay? If insulin isn't there, then can you break down chyla microns? No. So that little creamy layer on the top, that builds up. And see that little creamy layer down there? That's VLDL. Builds up, and you have massive hypertriglyceride. Okay, we're done. And basically, I, I think I accomplished it in the sense of it probably confused you, but at least you kind of follow the fact that by knowing basic science facts, you're able to pretty much figure out clinical things that you don't have to memorize now, you understand it. That's the key point. And also, if I get some of you in here that want to be doctors, doctors, that would be a really, uh, that'd be icing on the cake. So thank you, and uh, be great doctors.